Rich, are uh, you on, on with us? Welcome, everybody. Thanks for spending the evening with us. You know, it's kind of great we get to learn this way. And the guy, some guys are probably sitting out on the patio looking over the ocean somewhere. Yeah, that, I know at least one that is. <laughs> we can okay. talk about that in a few minutes. David, are you with us? I'm with you. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, we'll get started. We have a lot to go through. And welcome to the role of CBCT in dental sleep medicine. Hopefully we'll get the slide to advance. I'm Dr. Guy Yatros on the left of your screen there, and there's my partner Richard Drake on the right as you're looking uh, at this uh, screen. And I'm getting a little feedback from someone there. Uh, it must be, hopefully it's uh, someone on our end and we'll get that corrected. Rich, we've been doing this a long time, haven't we? Um, yes, we have. It has been, I don't know, gosh, I've been doing this 16 years now, nothing but sleep. and. Uh, you know, I, I've probably made several thousand dental devices, but I, I have to admit right up front here, Guy, <clears throat> you've been putting a bug in my ear. Man, this is cool. I, I bet I've heard you say that 50 times about this uh, cone beam, and you've got to get I, one of these. So I, I have to admit, uh, um, I, I'm as much a student here as I am a teacher tonight. So thanks well, for putting Well, that. for those of you who don't know the story, that's how I met Rich uh, probably 10 years ago. Uh, you were my mentor, and uh, together... Uh, we put together uh, uh, dental sleep practices and dental sleep solutions, which we'll talk about briefly. And uh, tonight we have a special guest, uh, David. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, again, thanks for having me, guys. I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm David Michaelis. I've been with Instrumentarium for a little over a decade now, focusing only on radiography. My, uh, my life is eating, sleeping, and breathing radiography, essentially. So... I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys have here and hopefully helping out a little bit. Well, very good. We have a lot to get through. We always want to thank Keller Labs. We've uh, been doing these webinars with them for quite a long time. We've been using their lab for a lot of our dental devices. I wear one of their dental devices every night, and we do a lot of courses with them as well. And uh, They're just a great resource for dental sleep. This is the dental device I wear most every night myself. It's a clear dream. I think I had the very first one they ever made, and it still looks just like that if I... Uh, take the time to clean it, which I try to. Uh, it's a great device. Uh, they make um, three dental sleep devices. Uh, next month we'll be talking about dental devices, and they make three of the four that that we do. Uh, Rich, I, I know you always like to talk about our our mission statement briefly. Are you there, Rich? Well, okay. If not, I'll talk about our our. Uh, uh, mission statement here. I don't know if we lost Rich. Uh, uh, David, you can still hear me, can't you? I'm here. All right, we'll keep going. Uh, dental Sleep Solution, we're the most trusted, innovative, and customer-focused provider of solutions in dental sleep medicine. Uh, it took us quite a long time, one full day of us deciding, you know, what are we all about? And we're about helping dentists achieve success in dental sleep medicine. Uh, if you have any uh, desire to learn more about what we're talking about tonight, uh, let's uh, come to one of our webinars, I mean, it's our, our CE courses. Uh, we offer them all over the country, one and two day courses. And if you type in today, course, and the city you want to come to, we'll give you $50 off a one day course, 200 off of a two day course. And uh, I know that we have a two day course coming up in a few weeks in, or in Orlando. So, uh, Rich, did you make it back yet? Can you hear me now? No, no. Yes, sir. There you are. Great. Yeah. Glad that you're back. Uh, in time to talk about our, are we excited about our symposium that we're doing in uh, January or February, whatever it is? Yeah, if you guys get a chance, uh, especially you north, you know, northerners, come down south and uh, join us in Florida. We're getting more and more speakers, and we're excited about the, you know, all the different topics that we're going to cover and, uh, you know, what we're going to talk about. I, I think, Guy, our mission statement, sorry, I, I got lost there for a minute, but, uh, you know, we really do help dentists do dental sleep medicine. I, I think we do it better than anybody. That's what we've spent the last eight years of our lives trying to put together a system for how to teach this and do this. So our our courses are very practical. Uh, they're very um, taught by people who are wet-fingered dentists who do this all day, every day for the most part. And, and I think uh, if you guys get a chance to come down and do that, it, it will be time well yeah. worth it. And if you sign up before the end of the month, it's $50 off. Uh, it's already an incredible value for all the speakers. You can see we have these speakers, uh, uh, just uh, about 20 hours total of CE. Uh, come down next uh, 
winter and spend the, uh, two days on Clearwater Beach. Uh, by the way, the CE for today will uh, Keller will provide to you, so uh, you know you will get CE for this as well. If you want to ch uh, check out what we do, how we help dentists, we're not a high pressure organization. We'd love to show you what we can do and how we can help you. And we, if you just type in to the question box uh, free trial and someone will contact you, most likely Eric tomorrow, or the, and tell you all about what we can do and it's uh, absolutely free and you can learn a lot of, uh, more education and uh, systems that we have to make you efficient. All right, we're going to get going because we've got to stay on time. We've got a lot to go through and uh, I know a lot of you dentists have seen this and you've seen it in other presentations, but I really don't think there's any other uh, facet of, of dentistry or what we could talk about that is more true. That uh, it's oftentimes when we look at our patients' mouths and we use the tools that we have available, uh, we're really just seeing the tip of the iceberg uh, compared to what we might see if we have 3D. Uh, David, I know that you like to explain this slide and I, I think this just really hammers it home. You want to tell us about what the difference here? Yeah, this is just a real simple slide. We're all so used to looking at x-rays from either a buccal or lingual aspect depending on how you look at them. But if you had the ability to see it from a cross-sectional point of view, which is the next slide if you don't mind, Guy, it gives you a lot more information before you ever do anything in bases. Yeah, I think that's the key and one of the uh, questions that Rich asked me was, you know, you know, I've been involved in this for quite a while now due to my partner. Uh, my, I brought a, a new partner in to my personal sleep practice and she really uh, had was excited to come visit, uh, to come work with me. She visited my office and uh, she was going to move down. I'd already been doing dental sleep for about a half dozen years. But the one thing I didn't have that she said she just couldn't practice without well was, was comb beam. And she said, you know, there's just certain things we can't see. It's just the way she uh, practices. And uh, part of our agreement was I would, we would get one when she came in and, and, and we do uh, have one in our office now. And, and all we do is dental sleep. But man, if I was going to have a endo done on my mouth, uh, you know, and I was having any problems or any of my patients, uh, I'll let David explain this slide again. I think this is uh, uh, one of the many uses other than airway that we can use comb beam for. Well, this is just a great example of the guy of another case where somebody come presents with pain and it's already obviously endodontically treated. You don't see anything on the PA. And this happens so many times in offices where you don't see anything on the PA, you don't see anything on a pan. However, if you would take a 3D of this image, it's pretty obvious yeah. we completely missed the canal. Right. Right. You can see it here on the top left. Uh, bottom left, it's quite obvious that the canal is, and just to back it up, and when you look at that, uh, we'd be, why is this person having problems? Is it a root fracture? What's going on? And uh, we have the, you know, uh, we have a three-dimensional body and having a three-dimensional picture can make all the difference. We are going to focus on airway in just a little bit, but I think first we're going to briefly talk about the other uses for 3D uh, in, in, in the practice and all the things you see here. I, I can tell you uh, I wouldn't have an implant without considering what's going on in the bone three-dimensionally. Uh, we can talk briefly about these. We've come a long way from the mound of films. Remember taking those films out and filling the dots and putting them in the right direction and, you know, and, and, and the, all the hassle. And then we got digital uh, 2D. Now we have digital 3D. And that's just an uh, incredible difference. And I think one of the reservations that I had, David, uh, as I've expressed to you and I expressed to Tara, uh, Dr. Griffin, my partner, when she wanted to get the comb, I was like, yeah, but what about the radiation? I, I know that there's more information there. No one's going to argue. If you could, if everybody could have a three-dimensional picture instead of a two-dimensional, why wouldn't we want that? I mean, everybody would agree. And my reservation was, is it, is it worth it with the radiation? And I didn't understand the difference between a regular medical CT and a cone beam uh, and, and why there's such a difference. Can you briefly explain uh, what the difference is? Sure. Without getting too technical, it, it really is apples and oranges. The, the, fan ba the fan beam CT that you see on the left is, is your medical CT. It basically takes a thin slice rotating around the head. With a dental comb beam, we're taking photographs essentially. So think of it in the way that we take hundreds of photographs and then crush it into a volume. With dental comb beam, we're able to do that with tiny doses, very small MA, very small KV, and we get great spatial resolution, but we get very poor contrast resolution. In other words, we can't tell you if something's cancerous, I can't tell you what type of cancer it is. You would need a medical CT in that sense. However, dental comb beam actually images hard tissues better than a medical CT would. Wow. 
which and that's why it's we're less really ready to, because of the way it works. Correct. Which we're going to get into in just a few minutes. And that that to, I, mean, I understand that I think, uh, but really to me, what it relates to is we get a really great image where we can even see soft tissue a little better, and we're not going to be radiating our patients, lighting them up, giving them a lot of unnecessary radiation, and all the uses you see on the screen. Uh, general dentist use, and again, um, I'm just using it for just TMD and, and mostly sleep, and uh, I'm so glad that my partner convinced me uh, to go down this road. Uh, when she came to me and she was like, well, we're going to do this, and I said, all right, well, when you come in, we'll agree to it, do it, but we're going to get the right piece of equipment. Uh, what do we look for? And, and to me, again, the radiation was important. Uh, we also didn't have a Panorex in our office, so how good is the Panorex that we can either extract out of the 3D or do just a 2, 2D if we want to do. Of course, cost is important and, you know, space is important. We uh, keep expanding and we keep running out of space and uh, how big the footprint is uh, and important. Anything else, David, I'm forgetting when we're looking for considerations on, on purchasing one? The biggest, the biggest consideration is what you want to do in your office. Every office is a little unique. You want to find a machine that can fit to your office. You don't want to make your office fit the machine. Simple as that. Very good. And again, uh, uh, Rich uh, is looking into doing this in his office, so in full disclosure, he doesn't have a cone beam yet. And again, I've been whispering in his ear, or sp so I guess it would be more like speaking loudly, you need to get involved in this. Uh, and I think um, by the end of the, this presentation, maybe we'll, 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 he'll see a little bit more himself with this. And again, the dose was the, 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 the holdback for me uh, for, for many years. I think you have a good story, David, about what this New York Times yeah, this goes back to 2010 when this article was done on a few offices that were orthodontists using a, a machine, which thankfully wasn't one of mine, but they were taking 3Ds. This is before low-dose protocols, and so cone beam was significantly higher radiation than, say, a pan Ceph, which is your standard protocol in ortho, and they were taking those as their records more to sell cases than to actually improve treatment or shorten treatment outcomes, and that scared a lot of people away from the 3D side of things for a little while. Oh, gotcha. Well, um, hold on. Let me advance the slide here. I can't get to it. There it is. Uh, when we when we look at the uh, exposure now, uh, one thing we also want to look at look at is who we're treating. And with sleep in general, and a lot of our patients we're going to be using cone beam on uh, implants. I mean, we're not doing a whole lot of those on eight year olds. I don't think, if any at all. I wouldn't think we'd be doing any. Uh, so really, the older you are. Even if you do get some exposure, which you're going to see is minimal sh shortly, uh, the risk becomes very negligent. And here in Florida, most of mine are at the bottom of uh, of that. They're the 50 and above, which is uh, not not near the uh, risk as a, as, a, as a kid. Anything want to add to that, David? No, nope, you hit it. Okay. All right. Well, and I guess the other thing I want to emphasize is I've learned more about this is really the vast majority of any uh, the radiation any of us get is natural, 83% uh, versus 17%. So across the board, most of what we're getting is is natural. I fly a lot, uh, Rich, uh, this uh, you should think about. It. I know you fly a lot. We, we lecture all over the country. David, I know you do as well. And uh, I didn't know what a microceiver was until a year or so ago. Uh, eight microceivers is what you get just from sitting in your house, walking around on this earth uh, uh, each, each day. And then if you fly, uh, you get 80 to 100. So, you know, an eight-hour flight uh, can, can, can give you that amount. So I think that puts it a little bit in perspective. You can even go to that website there on the page and tell them where you're going, and it'll calculate the, the exposure that you're, that you're getting. And uh, this is what kind of convinced me, David. I'll let you explain the, you know, what the, what the equivalence is. And I think we have another slide after that, too, I'll let you talk about. Yeah, this is just a real quick slide in regards to none of us hesitate to take pans or full mouth series and if you look at this the full mouth series very few clinicians are using rectangular collimation they're using round that's where you're looking at your digital setting is still 128 microsieverts when you look at cone beam we're going to get down if you can go to the next slide real quick okay Did I pass with the low there. dose there we go so there we go for. with the low dose protocols you can get down as low as taking a bite wing so when you're, when you're comparing comb beam to pans, the story's really changed in the last couple of years. The information that we can give you for the radiation dose, especially in airway, for 32 microsieverts compared to a full mouth series at 128, it's night and day. 
Yeah, that, I mean, that's, uh, again, I'm getting more than that when I fly uh, to give one of my lectures <laughs> one way, you know. Yeah. I think this this is one of the reasons that, David, you're on the phone with us today because I did uh, uh, purchase an instrumentarium unit. And, again, my big holdup over the years, and, and the cost is real, but I think for, with more than paying for this each month as, as we're using it, uh, but was the, was the dose. And this automatic dose control, I, I thought, really made sense. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide as you explain it? Sure, that'd be great. This automatic dose control is essentially a patented feature on an instrumentarium product. But what, what it does is, in an average office, you have four or five staff members. And most of those staff members are not going to change the settings when it comes to patients and they're taking PANS or taking comedies. They're just going to shoot everybody the same. Just like when they're taking intraorals, they don't change it based on where they are in the mouth. So what we did at Instrumentarium is we allowed the sensor to register the radiation being received, and it controls the tube head live time. That way, your staff doesn't have any of the worries about changing the settings. The clinicians get the perfect image every time. And more than anything, your patients are safer. They're getting the lowest dose possible, even though they're getting the best images taken. Right. And you would have a different dosage, whether you're doing Shaq here or this little kid uh, little, uh, uh, on, on the left. So, and it automatically does that for you. So I think that, that to me, I think in a combination with that, you have this low dose available, which is what we use for most of our patients. Because, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not doing a root canal on these people. I'm just wanting to see big structures, see if things, uh, we'll show you here in just a few minutes what I'm looking for. And the low dose scan shows me everything that I really need to know. And, of course, you do have uh, the ability to change that for things like endo or, or other reasons that you may want a higher dose. Anything else on that, David? Yep, no, this just talks to, you know, when you're trying to pick a machine, whether it's ours or somebody else's, just make sure that you have resolutions for what you need. Right, very good. And then there's different sizes and uh, that you can get, so different fields of view. Uh, if you get over here towards the right, uh, you can do airway with, with the last two pretty easily. Uh, the last one's better. That's the one I have because you get everything in one image. If you wanted to get the the nose, uh, nasal airway, in addition to the oral airway and the teeth, you may have to take separate images. And so there's different fields of view depending on which uh, particular unit you're gonna 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 purchase. Uh, I think we have that uh, shown here. This is what a 13 by 15 that, that we have. We can see everything from the nasal, uh, the, the nose to the sinuses to the airway down to the epiglottis and back to the TMJ joints. Uh, anything else to add on that, David? Right, what, so, is the, what is the 13 by 15 guy? What does that mean? I, I, I see the field of view is quite a bit bigger, right. you know, top to bottom, left to right, all, all the way around. Is that? It's, let me go back to this. So thanks for asking, Rich. It's the centimeters, right, David? 13 by, by 15? Correct. 13 centimeters tall by 15 centimeters wide. So when you look at a, a cone beam, Rich, it, you're looking at a cylinder. So we're always going to give you your field of view based on height by width is what you're going to be looking at. Yeah, so that's the size and, and, and with a 13 by 15 I can get everything like this in one image. Uh, the 8 by 15 you can see we don't we don't have, let me back up a minute, see how we've got the nose and here's the, the image I like on the bottom left for the nose. Uh, you, you've got all that in one scan. With this one you can still get it but you'd have to, if you want to see the, the nose in addition to this and it, uh, and the depending on where you position it, maybe the TMJs, you'd have to take another image up higher and then look at two separate images as opposed to seeing everything at once, you know, which is okay. really nice not only for me, it's nice for the radiologist we send it to, and it's also super nice when demonstrating this to the patients, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. So, and of course, we can look at these at any custom view, uh, axial, sagittal, coronal, or just to give you a, uh, you know, a little anatomy lesson if we forgot what those things are. 3D, to me, uh, this is what it's added more than I thought it would. It adds value to the treatment. And, Rich, you can understand this. As we do dental sleep, sometimes it's hard. Whatever the patient has to pay out of pocket and whatever we end up uh, billing the patient, it's hard to add to build value. We have to work at that because what we're doing is giving people a piece of acrylic they wear in their mouth. And they're, like, they're spending a certain amount of money on that. And we do well with building value, but I can tell you, when you add this image and you show them their airway and you're looking at their joints and you're looking at their nose and you're having a radiologist, which I'll get to in a moment, review it, and we go over that with them, it adds more value than what they're paying 
for, even if they don't have insurance, because insurance does pay for, in our office, about one out of four of these, if we can get up to, on average, $250, uh, we get more than that sum, less than that sum, that's probably about what we're averaging, but even if they're not paying for it, if they are paying for it, it adds the value, can, can you understand it, Rich, you know, you know how it is with the, with the, uh, the devices sometimes, I'm just giving me a piece of acrylic. Oh, I've, I've never heard a patient say, you want how much for that piece of plastic? <laughs> And I go, yeah, but it's saving your life. And, you know, the other thing I think I see here too, Guy, is uh, as, I'm, as I'm listening to you guys and I'm seeing that is how many more dental devices I sold when I actually, you know, anted up and bought a, a demo model for $200. Right. You know, I just think how visual people are. And I think seeing the airway and seeing a lot of that stuff – I think I think it helps get people over the hump in a it, lot of different ways. And you're going to see that in a few minutes, and it's just so cool when you can you know show them uh, how their 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 anatomy 3D. Uh, it builds practice differentiation. I can't say that differentiation, uh, even if you're just doing sleep. I can't imagine if I had this back when I had my dental practice. Uh, anything else on this these last two slides, David? You want to add? The only thing I would add is I, I think you're right on the money, when, and I always kind of joke, when was the last time you bought a car because a mechanic said that it was the right car for you? You know, the mechanic knows everything about cars, but the bottom line is you still like to see it in person before you pay for it. Very good point. And, you know, the patients are going to perceive your practice. I mean, I think everybody on this call, we don't have to emphasize that. If, uh, you know, if we're doing films or we're doing digital or if we're doing something as cool as 3D, they're going to see that it's that you're the, the type of practice willing to invest in the health of your patients. But from an efficiency standpoint, I think you're going to rule out and you're going to see some things that maybe you didn't see. And wouldn't it be nice if you knew that that root canal had four canals? Wouldn't it be nice if you knew that third molar you're going to extract is sitting on the nerve? But wouldn't it be nice if we saw some things about the airway we didn't know, which I'm going to show you with the case in a, in a few moments. So, uh, I, you know, if I had to have an endo, I, I, which was not on wood, I hope I don't anytime soon, I, I would, you know, if anything at all looks suspicious, I would want to see a 3D picture of it before they got into it. And again, the third molar evaluations, uh, if uh, uh, I got my, my son turned 10 yesterday, and he's sitting right here. We took him to see the dolphins uh, swim with him today, and if someday he's probably going to have to have his wisdom teeth taken out, and we're going to do an image to, before I would even consider uh, letting an oral surgeon talk to him. We already did do an image on him to, to see where his canines were because orthodontics oh, went too far. Orthodontics is a big, big uh, thing now we can see. He, the orthodontist wants to know where his canine was. He doesn't have a, a, a machine, and we we – took the first pedo uh, film the other day because most of our, our patients are adults and we could uh, got it over to the orthodontist so we can uh, see where where that canine's uh, head. Anything else, David, I'm missing on that and we're going to get to airway. Nope, you're good to go. All right, so that's what everybody tuned in for. So I will mention that when it comes to airway, you know, you, know, you can buy this for your implants and, and we know the units are expensive and I, I don't have any interest in an instrumentarium. I don't get any money if you buy one of these, by the way. Uh, but you can pay for this machine literally over the span of your loan with, with sleep. And, it's, and if, even if you're purchasing it for your implants. So buy it for implants, purchase it for your sleep. If you do uh, $2,500 a case, which is a moderate amount for dental sleep, and you do one a month, over the five years, you're going to make enough to roughly pay for your machine just in the sleep if it helps you do more sleep in your practice, which I think it will, uh, I'm confident it will with most uh, offices. If you do two a month, you're going to actually pay for the machine and have a, another 100000 or so left over. And if you do uh, roughly one a week, you're going to add a half million dollars to your practice over five years. So to me, this is the first kind of cool, new, game-changing thing that's come out, uh, at least in my practice. And here's the uses, how we use it in dental sleep. Uh, screening, patient candidate, CTMJ, nasal airway, and that last one I have a, I have a question mark by because I'm starting to experiment with this with some of our patients who are non-responders and seeing if maybe we can find a better position for their jaw. So the jury's still a little bit out because the patients aren't asleep when we're doing this, but I do believe I'm starting to get some information that's helping direct uh, our, our, our treatment plan somewhat. I think what you said, Rich, this is where that comes into play in a lot of offices. You know. Uh, I started a practice scene in Florida 25, almost 26 years ago, I guess now, 
and the guy I went to work for had just purchased a Fuji cam. And I don't know if you people remember what a Fuji cam, that was the intra oral camera that first came out and it was twenty five thousand dollars. I remember him telling me that and he was like, Gosh, you bought this is twenty five grand? That was a lot of money twenty five years ago. And he's like, It's paid for itself in the first three months. Because uh, you could instantly show a picture and show what was going on with the tooth, and people would get crowns done. And you know now you can buy those cameras maybe for fifty cents. But uh, <laughs> I don't think Comey's ever going to. It's a lot more complicated technology. But can you imagine you have a patient coming in, and they're resistant to getting a sleep test, and we, just like we went through last time, and uh, you know that maybe the the patient just is kind of in denial about their airway, and you can show them here on the the left their airway versus a a big open airway and you can spin it around as I'm going to show you and say you know we're really concerned if look how this is the best it gets when the airway is uh, you're awake you're standing upright you're you're breathing uh, when you're asleep all that stuff's going to get smaller and so here's how easy it is to map out the airway I don't think you've even seen this get a uh, first hand, hand look at how we map out the airway and I'm doing this in real time on one of our patients who has a decent size airway which I wanted to show you first this is uh, a patient that, uh, that has a decent size airway, just that quick you map out the airway and you can see the, the red there or you can see just the airway itself and you can see that minimal cross-section area of 218 in this case. Uh, you can look at it in uh, various views, I'm not going to show you all the views but you can see uh, how you know impressive that would be to the patient showing them their airway, uh, showing them uh, uh, with this particular view you can see the bony structures better and you can you know um, show it in relationship to their their teeth. I like this view quite well for the patient and I like the one that's right there on the top right uh, as we can see. Can you imagine uh, if this is the, the patient while you're sitting there and you're showing them this and I oftentimes will show the patient a big airway like this to start with uh, and say this is what we're looking for. Uh, they're resistant to having a test. They're saying you know I'm not sure that I that I have this problem. Well, let's take an image. We need some to look at your teeth anyway. We may want to use the pano feature with it. Uh, we may want to look at their sinuses for some reason. We may want to look at other things. Uh, we can do this image back for that 32 microsievers of uh, exposure, and we can see their airway this way. Um, so one thing I will mention is we use this study here where we can see that you know the patients aren't asleep. They're, they, they're, there's, it's not exact. But it does put people in risk categories, and that's what we do in sleep, isn't it, Rich? What do we what do we do for screening? We see who's at risk, correct? That's all we're doing. And man, you're right. I I'm I'm awed at some of those images. Uh, I, I just can't I just can't believe how much information you get, guy, in in so many different areas. And it's I, I think you know in the not too distant future we'll look back at this stuff and say why why did we ever do anything besides this. I mean, it just well, I think that's the, that's the point. If it was free and everybody had one, I mean, it really comes down to value. And why why wouldn't you look at things two three dimensional when you can look at them that way? Why why not? And to exposure and cost. And I would I'm not concerned about the exposure anymore after what we just went through. Uh, and I think it's well worth the cost when you think of all the aspects you can use it for. Uh, here we can see a person who has less than a 52 millimeter square uh, uh, minimal cross-sectional area is at very high risk for airway problems. A moderate 52 to 110 and above 110 it's a little bit lower. It doesn't mean they're not at risk but we're not quite as worried for them. And we can see here's a patient we had come in and they were a little resistant to, to getting their uh, 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 sleep test and as you can see we showed them the, the bigger airway first. This is what we're looking for. Let's take a scan on you. And you can see this patient's at 27. Uh, we look at it all the different ways if you want. They're at 27. Look how narrow that airway is. I mean this is when they're awake. They're breathing right now. I, I watched them breathe as we did the test, as we did the scan. So I know they're, they're breathing. Can you imagine? They're trying to get air through that littlest place right there. Uh, and <laughs> And they're, and they're awake. I can't imagine what's going to happen when they're asleep. And if we can explain that to them, we can show them this and we can show them, look how little your airway is here. And one thing I'm pointing out to you, you notice this, one thing I've noticed, Rich, that you'll, I think you'll uh, appreciate is the tongue. Look where the tongue is. It's filling up the whole uh, palate, it looks like. And compare that to someone who doesn't have an airway problem. See how much space we have here versus here and look at the size of the airway. And looking, you can look, see it in whatever uh, sections you'd prefer to look. I kind of like the top one here, uh, but if you look at this, you can see, look how small that airway. Do you think that would help convince 
someone to go get a, a benign, uh, you know, non-invasive sleep test where they can spend a few hundred dollars and, and wear a, a, a gadget home to see if they're breathing? Yeah, we talk about that all the time, guy. You know, how do you how do you you, know, you get the horse the water? How do you make him drink? So we've talked about different ways of screening and doing this, and this is certainly another really nice tool to have in your bag. Absolutely. I think it's ever bit as valuable as that intro oil camera was for the dentist I I started working for uh, 25 years ago. He went from just you know a few crowns a, a week to a few crowns a day because of that uh, uh, technology. So that's the first use is, is I really believe it'll help dentists who want to screen their patients uh, and they're, they're screening them, the patients are at risk, maybe they, they just can't get them to get a sleep test and if we can show them something like that, that's the, uh, I think that'll get them over the edge and get the sleep test. Now once we begin treatment, uh, I'm gonna go through some things with a, a real patient here in a few minutes, but we're looking for abnormalities. If, if we're going to treat this patient, wouldn't we like to know that those adenoids are, are, are overgrown, that, that that would affect uh, how, how well they might adapt to a dental device? Rich, would you like to know this if this was a dental sleep patient or even if it was a kid and uh, he's having some um, ADHD and some breathing problems, grinding their teeth at night and snoring and we're wondering if they have uh, airway problems. Wouldn't this maybe make some sense? Yeah, again, that's just a uh, this is I'm, I'm learning a lot of this stuff as you're talking about it, but I mean, how how can you answer no to any of those things you've asked? Uh, you you're just in some ways we, we're we've been operating in the dark, and th this is allowing us to just see so much more. You're the one who told me how important years ago the nose is. When I had cases, uh, and what we do. By the way, at Dental Sleep Solutions, as we help dentists succeed at dental sleep medicine, and how you helped me be, be better, Rich was talking about the nose. You've got to look at the nose uh, for for these patients. And uh, until I had a comb beam, my test was, can you breathe through your nose? Uh, yes or no? And maybe watch them breathe through their nose. Uh, and some of our failures from some of our, our clients who have challenges, oftentimes it, when they ask Rich or myself to help them with the case and it's not going well, don't we always ask them about the nose? When a lot of times that's something they missed, isn't it? Yes, it is. I say it's one of the most important questions you can ask. You know, uh, we do anything and everything we can to help people breathe through their nose better. And, and unless you have an ENT in your office with you, you don't have access to this stuff. So, yeah, I mean, and what, people. What do the turbinates look like? Go back that one slide, okay. guy, and pull them out, and then go to the CT. Yeah. So the turbinates, there's. I think my point here before I get into the brief anatomy lesson is patients will tell you they've breathed fine through their nose even when they maybe don't. And that's the ones, the ones that know they have a nose problem, that's good, they're gonna tell you. And then you can document, you can talk about how that may affect, negatively affect either CPAP or dental device as far as that goes. And uh, you know, we need, we need to be aware of this and we don't wanna wait till after we've treated them to say, oh, by the way, we just notice you can't breathe through your nose because some patients won't tell you. They think they breathe fine. And what we're going to look for here are the turbinates. There's three uh, turbinates. There's the inferior, superior, uh, middle. And basically they're uh, mucosa around uh, the concha, I think it's called, back to the anatomy lesson. And what we want to look for here when we look at the image are the dark areas. And you can see the dark areas are where air goes through. And that's what we want because that's what helps Patients do far better when they breathe through their nose, and uh, it helps filtration. It helps this temperature. It just helps a lot of things. And uh, you can see this angle here very well. And I'll show you as we go through the various planes. You can see what uh, how how someone's nose is doing. Wouldn't that be nice to know before you uh, get started treating your patients, Rich? I say, what? I don't see a lot of black space there either. Yeah, it doesn't. Well, how about this guy here? You know, he's got his, this one's got a, a nose that's deviated. Uh, one thing we also need to talk about, when we sleep at night, we go through what we call nasal cycling. So our, for whatever reasons, we're engineered to swell up one side of the mucosa for 15 minutes to 30 minutes, and it kind of forces us to breathe through one side, and then it rotates over to the other side, and then we are forced to breathe through that side. So someone who has a nose like this, may have problems when it cycles to the bad side. Uh, and how about this person? We can watch this as it goes through. This is how you can look at the nose. And look up here at the top. You can see the nose. This side's pretty open. Can you see as we go back through, look at the your, your screen on the left, see all the deviation 
uh, is is uh, is off, and you can see that even though one side's nice and open, the other side's very closed. And this patient, I guarantee you, has problems at night at times as it goes through that cycling. Um, do you know how I know that, Rich? No. How do you know that? Well, have you ever seen me up close? <laughs> Notice my nose. Years ago, I broke a guy's fist with it, and uh, that was my nose. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how I can personally tell you. And I really didn't think about breathing. I, you know, I thought I breathed all right. Then my nose didn't think much about it until I learned more and more. And uh, I do wear a dental device, and there's times when my allergies act up that, that my device doesn't work as well. And I'm actually met with an ENT, and it's on my long list of things to do is to get that uh, addressed. So this is some, the one thing if you miss it will absolutely come back to haunt you, especially even if you figure it out later, you're going to tell the patient, oh, well, here's the problem. You need to go to an ENT and, uh, and have this checked out. And then it sounds like we're making excuses as opposed to, to saying it a, a, ahead of time. Plus, it'll help our referral base and, and working with our ENTs if, we're, uh, if we can send over a cool image like that. They're going to be like, wow, this is the person I want to work in with in town. So, uh, by the way, uh, just to, uh, for those of you who joined in late, we will get to all your questions, put them in the question box, we'll have an opportunity to raise hands at the end. And if you're interested in knowing about DS3, uh, we'll be happy to give you a free trial, just type in free trial, and in a couple of weeks we can show you everything about how we can help your nail seat practice. And at the end, we're also going to put up the courses that we have uh, coming up, and you get $50 off of one day and $200 off of two day, just type in uh, course and uh, to lock in that discount today if you can. All right, so we're going to move on to the other thing we look for. Do you think mandibular advancement devices affect the TMJ, Rich? Are we doing anything there we should be thinking about? Yeah, we, I don't even think we know in what, <laughs> what ways they do, but yes, short answer, yes. Yes, I mean, and, and for years what we do is we we you know palpate them and we note if they're cracking or popping, and, and I think that's certainly good. But now let me show you what we can learn. And I know, David, you're still there. If you have anything to add, this is a little bit more the dental sleep stuff. So uh, are we missing anything on any of this, David? I just want to, don't want to disclude you. Nope, this is your world. All right, very good. Well, I'm going to go on. You know, what we're looking for in the joint is things maybe that we didn't, we weren't going to see, or uh, didn't think we were going to see, even if the sometimes people's joints aren't painful. Sometimes they're not obviously noisy, and uh, just because someone's young, here's a 23-year-old that's got degenerative joint disease. We'd certainly want to know about that. We want to look at the, head, the condylar heads. Uh, are they getting flatted, or there's things called bird beaking? Is there, this does at least have a nice space in here. Are they sitting on bone on bone? And here's the good news is you don't have to become an expert in this. I mean, I think the more you learn, it's better and it's enjoyable. It's kind of challenging and fun, and we can explain it to our patients better. But each one of these images, we do have a radiologist review, and we just put that into our fee. It's uh, roughly $75 to have them review. But it adds a ton of value when we go over that report. Uh, with our patient. So here's a real patient that came in a, a few months ago into mine and Dr. Griffin's practice. This is a screenshot, by the way, of DS3. And one thing that Rich and I love about DS3 is how you can just see everything you want to know about a patient without having to click a hundred different uh, uh, places. And uh, we could go through all that with you if you want, but we'll, in order to stay on time, I'm going to just go right into to, to the, to the, what we found according to the CVCT. Here's the one that I use. It's the instrumentarium. Uh, it's uh, the OP300. It's the exact one. Again, I have the 13 by 15, so I can get the whole thing in one image. And it doesn't take up much room, too, which is the other thing that I, that I liked about it as well. And it's, uh, Rich, the next time you're in Florida, we'll have to take an image on you and to see it. It's just really cool when you hit the buttons, and it sounds like R2-D2 spinning around the circle. And uh, it's the first toy I've had in the since I sold my dental practice, and it's, I, I get excited to go back in and the office and, and, and have the patients uh, use it and then review it with them. As far as what data we can get out, uh, Rich, what do you do for, for your patients? Do you do panorexes? Uh, you, you, you usually don't treat them, I would assume, without a, a panorex or an FMX or something? Yeah, and I don't have any of that in my office, so we request that from their dentist of record. So it's right. a real pain in the rear. Yeah. Uh, to try to do all of that stuff. Well, I'm sure the ones you get are always high quality and no problems there, right? 
I can't even tell there's teeth on some of them. <laughs> we got one the other day. I, 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 I don't even know it was the right part of the body. I mean, so that's what we used to do too. Since we're doing sleep only, I didn't have a Panorex machine. And uh, we certainly can do a Panorex with the machine we have. But when I take that 3D image, uh, I can extract a Panorex. It's called the Super Pano feature. And this is uh, the, the one on the patient we just showed you. And, you know, I see enough for us to, I mean, do you feel comfortable treating this person after you do your exam, your, your, your actual exam in the mouth, but we, I feel good that enough to know that there's nothing devastating going on with that patient that, that uh, anchoring their teeth to hold their jaw forward is not going not gonna, to uh, be too high a risk. Do you agree, Rich? Yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly a lot better than 99.9 well, of what I get. Right, and again, we took the 30, the, the low dose, uh, full scan of 13 by 15, and then you go to the pano feature, and it'll make a Panorex for you just like this. So, so I've got, you know, I'm already getting that image now, and I don't have to rely on calling the, you know, the patient's dentist and getting that old duplicated X-ray from a, uh, you know, 100 years ago, uh, and that's after they duplicate it two or three times, it's just just not good. Occasionally, we get some good films, but most of the time, it's not. So here's this patient. Uh, that, that, that we saw, and he, he was referred to us, I think it was a radio, we do a fair amount of radio, and we also get referred uh, by, uh, by some of the specialists, I think this was actually both, and you know, he, he knew he was at some risk, but he was kind of hesitant at the same time, and can you see, uh, his airway is not as tiny as the other one, but I think it's a 70 here if you see, and I think as we go forward, uh, you can see his minimal 70.9, so roughly 71. If you recall that, Rich, did you learn anything? It's under 110 more than 50, so that puts them at moderate risk for OSA, uh, as, as you can see from that. I, re I remember that. Pardon me? I remember that. All right, very good. And here's the report. Uh, again, it's real simple to upload these to a radiologist, and most companies you'll that you would buy a, a unit from can hook you up with them. We can certainly tell you who we use for this. And uh, it comes back a nice report. There's usually several pages. This is one of them. Of two, it says there it's got photographs on the back, still shots. I didn't include that. So, um, you know, again, the way we do this in our office, we take the image. It takes a couple minutes to render, and then we quickly show the patient a, a, a view of it. Say, well, yeah, your airway looks small. Here's your joints. Let's, you know, I'm going to analyze this more thoroughly. We're going to send it to the radiologist, and when you come in next time, we're going to go through it with you. But they get a chance to to look at the, the images and. And you know, we kind of show them what we're seeing, and, and, and when they leave after we take this, even before we go over the radiology report, it's added more value, in my opinion, uh, than, than it costs the patient. They've gotten something besides that piece of acrylic that we're handing to them and, and all the follow-up. I'm not minimizing what we're doing, but it certainly adds value to it. Um, when they come back in, we've, uh, for the, we typically uh, will do this maybe when they agree to treatment. Uh, at the consult, or we might do it at the beginning uh, of the impressions appointment, and then we'll review the analysis with them uh, before we deliver the device. And in this case, the airway analysis, this is straight quoted from the uh, radiologist that went through it and that said that the, you know, when, how long the soft palate was, and uh, also it talked about the minimal cross-section area here of 70, as we saw, and it put this patient at intermediate risk for obstructive sleep apnea. If this patient hadn't had a sleep test yet, uh, we've got not only our opinion, we've got the screening test, we've got a radiologist telling them that you're at risk, uh, you, you know, we might want to go ahead and get the test done. In this particular case, the patient already had a test, I believe, so uh, I'm confident they did it this time, and, uh, and we didn't need it for that. Any questions on that, Rich? Oh, that's good. I, you know, we're, we're sure collecting a lot of data even in our DS3 system, and, and we're going to have a lot of data if, if a lot of people start doing this, and uh, there should be some real good studies that can come out of how to predict uh, some of these things and, and just look at it, but it's impressive. Yeah, and so when I reviewed this, I saw, I noticed the floor of the sinus. I honestly didn't notice the top areas here. Uh, it was something that the radiologist pointed out, and but I also noticed that, you know, the nose just doesn't, you know, it looks kind of small. The airway uh, doesn't look great. Uh, and the patient hadn't really reported that they had any nasal problems. So, you know, it's something we want to discuss before we deliver their device to them. The radiologist actually noticed uh, the increased mucosal thickening on the floor, so that's the lower area there. And he, he said it may be due to allergies, 
or a condition of inflammatory origin, sinusitis. And they also noticed these mucus retentious mucus retention cysts uh, that were uh, on the floor of the sinuses as well. And so uh, he felt it may have a sinus polyp up in the top there. And so, you know, gosh, something we might want to talk about with our patient before we begin treatment. And I want to, at the end of this, talk to you about what I changed differently on this case than I would have had a not had comb me. But it's just something that if you just say, do you breathe through your nose well? And they say yes, and they just plug off their nose and try to and breathe through it. That was really, I had this fancy test. I always kid about it when I lecture, Rich. I don't know if you've ever seen me do it. I say, here's my breathing test. I tell the patient to breathe, and I put my finger on one side of the nose and tell them to breathe. And you can hear that's my one side. Oh, the other side goes real well. Well, you got a problem on one side. That was my fancy test. Do you have anything fancier than that if you're not using comb beam? Yeah, you're, you're, that, I taught you how to do that. <laughs> that's so, right. Well, that's I forgot I'm getting old. <laughs> You're right. Deck on. I was hoping I was taking credit for myself. You taught me everything I know, probably. But uh, here's how easy it is to look at the TMJs, too. So this is on that patient, uh, on, 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 on our patient that we're going through. And you just have these little zoom-in tools. And I'm not the expert on, on what the tools call. I forgot. But then you can see, if you look down the bottom left of your screen, you can pick as many slices as you want. And you can set that up however you want. We've got it set up for six images. And you can just scroll through the various aspects uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the joint as we go through moving it back and forth. And you can see, it, if you look closely, you'll see some uh, flattening and bird beaking. And we can zoom in and zoom out on those as you, as you want. Uh, but it's just that easy. It doesn't, I mean, I haven't spent tons and tons of time utilizing every feature uh, that the software has to offer, but it's pretty self-explanatory. They do come out and train you. But it's, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, and I've, I've played with the features that are really uh, important to me. And this particular patient, as we look at their joints, and so again, I just kind of zoomed in on some slices there. Can you see a little flattening here on the right joint? And that right there, if, I don't know, you can probably see my cursor, but if your screen's big enough, you can see a little what I would call bird beaking. And it's just where that bone's kind of sticking out a bit. Uh, and then we got a little flattening, uh, uh, and especially on the distal aspect of the left one. And again, I don't have to know that. I don't have to be an expert in it if I don't want to, but I've actually learned a lot over the last uh, year or so because when I miss something and then the radiologist sees it, I go back and look, and it's really it's, it's, it's fun to, 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 to educate myself on what's going on here. So here we are uh, with this patient, and the um, radiologist evaluation said there's evidence of mild sclerosis and flattening for the superior posterior surface of the left condyle and sclerosis for the posterior slope of the left eminence were noted. That left eminence, not eminences, was noted. So, okay, what does that mean? Well, we'll see in just a few minutes. And then the right condyle was a little smaller. I sure, certainly didn't notice that. Um, and basically, I thought the, sm the smallness and size uh, uh, might be evidence of sclerosis uh, or an osteophyte form motion. And, Mild sclerosis uh, for the posterior slope of the right eminence was noted. So, okay, that's pretty impressive. Uh, we'll talk about what that means in a minute. But, you know, this patient may be at more, more risk uh, for uh, TMJ problems. So it's nice to note if we're going to move their jaw forward, and, and, and which can that affect the TMJ, Rich? I, I think it does at times. Would you agree? I concur. <laughs> okay, well, you know, we, we'd like to know what, what, what it looked like beforehand and if there's any cons consideration. So uh, there, there, you can read it for yourself, but there was some uh, elongation and partial calcification for stylohyoid ligament process. Well, that's a mouthful. Uh, so we have the evaluation from the TMJ. And so they go through uh, what they see, and then the radiologist will give you uh, their impressions and the impressions on this particular case was that for the for the joint the patient had uh, not I'm sorry I went too fast here for the airway the findings should be considered a risk factor for obstructive sleep apnea so as they looked at that minimal cross-section area his conclusion was that the patient's at risk for obstructive sleep apnea and again we can we give a copy of this to our patient if they had not been tested do you think that would help uh, some of our offices or even yourself, Rich, if the patient was, you know, some resistant patient to doing this? Sure, I, I, 
you know what I've seen, guy, over the years is I can tell them something. It's it's kind of like my kids, right? I, I tell them something, it doesn't mean anything, and you walk in the room and tell them, and they go, oh, guy, he's so smart. Um, he does that. And I, true. I've, I've seen that. <laughs> I've seen that. That kind of stuff with this too, you know, when you have a, a separate radiologist who's, who's evaluating the image and doing all of this stuff, now people don't like to hear that they are at risk for something. And most of the time, I, I tell people, I challenge you to go home and read for 30 minutes online about obstructive sleep apnea and all the bad things that happen to you because of it. And, and any normal person would want to do something about it. And this is just another uh, way to get them to walk down the path that we want them to. Right. I see at least one hand raised when we'll, we finish here shortly and we'll open up your mic uh, and I know we're answering some of the questions as we go. So the impression for the airway, the patient's at risk for, for OSA and should be tested. And as you, you know, if you attended our last webinars, you, we went through how we get our patients tested. And here's the thing I think that's really important on this one as well, that the patient had non-active degenerative joint disease. Okay. Uh, what does that mean? Well, there's something going on with the joint, but it, maybe it's not currently uh, active. And it may dispose, you can read the rest of it yourself if you want, but it may dispose the TMJ uh, to TMJ dysfunction. And I think if I'm going to start pulling some patient's jaws forward and they're pr already predisposed to TMJ dysfunction, it would be nice that we knew that ahead of time and had a discussion with the patient ahead of time uh, about that. And we have a exact uh, image three-dimensionally of what their joint was before we ever touched them, which is a, is a nice thing as well. Uh, the final, the radiologist impression, most other findings uh, were noted above and um, no evidence of other abnormalities, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, that's a nice report against two, three pages usually. Uh, they have images in there, but then I like to go through it and I like to actually show them on the machine where we are. So here's our 41 year old patient. Um, we are going to treat him now and the question is what do we learn and what do we do different? What we learn is that the patient had small airway, had a small airway and they're at risk for OSA. Uh, if the patient hadn't been tested we may change something there. The nasal airway is compromised. The patient may have allergies and has some sinus abnormalities and the TMJs have some existing abnormalities. And if you go back to that pan, Rich, you agreed that the teeth Looks strong enough. We still need to do our own intraoral exam, but uh, we, the uh, panorex that we pulled out from the 3D image is sufficient for us to say that their teeth are, are adequate to do what we call dental sleep therapy. In other words, make them a mandibular advancement device, holding their jaw forward to uh, 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 open up their airway. So that's what we learned. And what I would do different, what I would suggest you would do different if you had a cone beam uh, image like this before you began treatment would be that you advise the patient they're at risk. Maybe you didn't know it. Maybe you took the cone beam for another reason uh, and you saw the narrow airway. Um, screening alone, just from questionnaires, does not get everybody who has airway problems. Some people will screen for low to moderate uh, and they still may have airway problems. And that's where we have to, I like what Rich always says, use your brain, right? And we got to measure their necks and so forth. And if we have an image like this, it may be the aha moment for us that, hey, we may want to look at something else, especially if we're going to restore their teeth. Uh, and uh, they have some dental problems. Uh, we could talk all day about how the airway could affect bruxism and some things like that, right, Rich? You bet. Yeah, and I, and I see, guy. I really see just listening to you go through this for the first time. I, this is the first time I've heard this. Uh, it's hard sometimes for me to get my patients to go see the ENT. And I get a lot of referrals from ENT, and you want to reciprocate that. And if I had those images of the nose, and I see that stuff, and the sinuses and that that kind of thing, it's like, look, man, this isn't an option. You've got to go see this guy. Can you imagine if you, if you yes. sent him over with a, with a uh, zip drive? We've got little zip drives from our practice, no dental sleep solutions. You send them over with a zip drive that they can just put in their computer, uh, and you can upload it to Dropbox. There's other ways of doing it. But then he can go in and, and it comes with the software to view it. And now he's got everything he needs. He, the, the patient doesn't almost ever need to go get a medical CT. Uh, they've got what they need to go ahead and treatment plan that patient and talk to them. They're going to think 
when it comes to who they refer to, I know they already refer most of the patients to you. You've been doing it a long time, but if you're the new kid in town and you send them an image like that, do you think that it might get your foot through the door a little bit quicker? Well, I'm hoping there isn't some young whippersnapper listening to all this going to show me up now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and again, there's many other uses for this. We're just talking about airway. We already went through the implant, the, the oral surgery, endo aspects, the treatment planning, and so forth. So back to this patient, I would advise them they're at risk. What else would I do differently? I'm going to talk to them that, look, you have some problems with your nasal airway. And because of that, you may not respond as well to dental device therapy. You may not respond as well to CPAP because they both have to have good noses. And you might consider seeing that ENT uh, before we begin treatment, or we, if things don't work as well, then you might want to see them afterwards. Isn't that a better way to do it than waiting to make an excuses uh, after we have problems? And, and it's really, they really feel you've done a thorough job when you talk about that. And lastly, we're going to get, have them uh, re re review uh, the risk benefits and alternatives of treatment. We're going to have them sign an informed consent. And of course, that usually says you're going to have some TMJ problems, but I'm going to make a special note on that, on the either on the on the form itself or in the chart stating that the patient's aware that they already have some existing TMJ problems and they're possibly at higher risk uh, for this. And, you know, we should still go, we do it all the time on patients who have this type of thing, this non-active degenerative joint disease, but you should be aware that, that you may be at higher risk than someone who doesn't have that. Wouldn't that be nice to have before you uh, begin treatment in case they do have any complications down the road? Well, like like you said several times in this presentation, Guy, it, it's so much easier uh, to do all of that stuff up front and look good rather than make excuses on the back end. Nobody, Very good. I, I've been there, and I don't like being in that position. I, I can no one it. does. We've all been there, and no one likes it, and that's how we can prevent that. Again, you could do it with root canals, too. Wouldn't it be nice if you had a fourth canal? Wouldn't it be nice before you put an implant in to know where that nerve is? Uh, and so forth. So a lot of uses here, but for dental sleep, it's certainly, we do it on all our patients now, Rich. Uh, well, I, I, I have to be truthful. We do it, we recommend it on all of our patients. Everyone in the Bradenton office gets that, gets one. Most of the people from Sarasota do because they have to drive 30 minutes. We have an office in Tampa. We don't get everybody to drive down for that. And I guess I know what David's thought would be. I need to buy two more. Is that right? Is that what, um, that would be the solution, right? It seems the easiest, doesn't it? <laughs> well, we're, we're thinking about it. We really are because uh, the Sarasota one, they can come, but we may have to do something for, for up in Tampa. So there's what we use it for. Uh, I think I hit all this except the jaw position. Uh, I have a physician I'm treating, and we're, we're, we're not getting exactly where we want. He really is concerned about his health. He doesn't want to wear a CPAP. Uh, we, we, I think maybe opening his vertical will be a little bit better, so we took an image with that. It did look better. Uh, he, he understood that was no guarantee that that was going to prove that, but we're going to see what happens. We're making him a device. So actually changed the device. We made him a tap instead to open up the vertical a little bit more, and we'll see. So I think it may give us some information to help us understand where the better jaw position is down the road, but that's uh, still a little bit up in the air. So well, we made it through on time. A couple of talk uh, information about us again. If you're going to do dental sleep, you have to have a plan. That's all there is to it. It's just pieces to a puzzle, and that's what we do. We've mentioned this. A lot of our lectures are on the pillars, screening, testing, treating, and billing. And if you have those under control, you will be successful, and we will help you with each of these. Uh, the next uh, webinar coming up, uh, I think, is on treating. And Here's how you get a hold of us. Uh, if you want to do a free trial, just type in free trial and we'll contact you or contact us. Uh, we can tell you that no one in this country, I truly believe, can help you more if you really want to get a dental sleep going in your practice. At least see some of your patients. We're not expecting to sell your practices uh, and, and just do dental sleep. Uh, some of you might, but most of you won't. But you should be able to help your patients who have airway problems because lots of them are out there and lots of them uh, can't wear a CPAP or don't want to wear a CPAP, and here's how you get the free trial, as um, as I mentioned. And uh, Rich, did you, have you read the, the latest uh, Dental Sleep Insider? Just your article, Guy, and your video. <laughs> it's so good every time. I think my recent one was on Kentucky Engineering. I'm originally from Kentucky, and you know, we show you cool things about dental sleep, and I think it's really, really pragmatic. It's free if you want to subscribe. There's where you go, uh, Dental Sleep Insider. We, uh, we did one on Comb Beam a little while ago. 
I did one on how you keep the tap from backing up a video. Rich wrote an article uh, in each one. Uh, just real good stuff. Anything else you want to say about that, Rich? Oh, it's just an amazing amount of good information in there. And it's it's a digital format. You know, we like to save trees and that kind of right. thing. So, and it's free. It's a great way to uh, learn something. Absolutely. Once a month comes out, just sign up for it. Our next webinar is August 30th, so not you know not even a month, right out a month away, I guess. And this is on treating your patients with the four devices that Rich and I use most in our practice. So uh, again, thanks Keller for putting this on because Keller does do three of the four. Uh, so we're very honest about our partners, and uh, Keller is one of our great partners. And we will talk to you about why you use these devices and where you use them and contraindications of each. So again, uh, save the date. Uh, August 30th, same time, 8 o'clock um, uh, Eastern uh, time, we will do that. Here's some upcoming courses we're always adding to this, so check our calendars. And again, only tonight, if you type in a course, uh, you'll get the discount for, for the uh, upcoming course, $50 if it's one day, and uh, 200 if it's a two-day. And we don't have a whole lot of two days left this year. We, we don't do as many of those. There is one coming up in Orlando that's, I think, almost sold out, so there is limited space. So if you want to do that, you better... Let us know soon, and again, there's the dates on the uh, North American Dental Sleep Medicine Symposium. We have more than these pe people speaking. These are kind of some of the headliners. Uh, Rich is speaking, myself, uh, Dr. John Rimmers, who you know, we, you know, we love and it's one of the most respected people in dental sleep. Keith Thornton, who invented the TAV. Aaron Elliott's going to talk about um, uh, staff uh, motivation, and then Stacey Lehman, uh, who's been doing dental build, sleep building longer than as long as longer than, than anybody will be helping our teams and offices with billing. So thank you. There's our information. We're going to answer some questions here. I do see we're typing some out, and I do see one hand raised here. So, Shane, if you're still with us here, I'm going to unmute you. And let, do you have anything else to say before I go to the questions, Rich? Sorry, I didn't mean just to bulldoze through that. No, thank you for putting that together. That was uh, very informative and uh well, you've got David's number to purchase one. I expect you to have one here very shortly. All right, Shane, I've unmuted you. Do you have an audio question you want to ask? Shane, are you there? Okay. I don't want any more, guy. Yep. Uh, he hung up. Okay. Uh, what about the questions? Anybody has any questions, you can raise your hand. You can verbally ask them, and I know we've been – Answering them as we go here. Do we got any? Let me see if we've got any we didn't answer. You see any we haven't answered, Rich? Let me pop this out to where it's bigger and I can see. Uh, one was Are you taking any CBCTs with an appliance in place to show the change in the airway volume? I think that's going to be very interesting. Uh, we're going to on this patient I just mentioned. Uh, that, you know, we're going to take one uh, once we get the tap delivered. Uh, and we might even take one of a couple of positions on him. He, he fully understands what we're doing there. So, yes, we're doing some of that. I don't, you know, the jury's still a little bit out uh, uh, out right now. So is there another, There's another one, too, Guy, from uh, Dr. Wyatt about is there a difference with, you know, just with the teeth touching or the teeth apart? Is there a big deal? Or what, what's yeah, I mean, it can. All that can affect the airway, and you need to try to do it consistently in your office. We have the patients bite together and, you know, MI and, and you know, the, how you position them with their head up straight. I try to get them consistent because that's one of the, the, the drawbacks when it looks at the airway is it's we're not asleep, we're not laying down, the tissues aren't relaxed. But I keep saying that it's, uh, you know, it's the best case scenario usually that we're capturing. So with that one patient I showed you that was so narrow, um, it's, uh, it's um, uh, the best that patient's likely going to be. And imagine what's going to happen when they're asleep. So, what are the questions? Yeah, that's, any better. that's for dang sure. Yeah. How hard is to stitch the images together? Does someone answer that one, I think, already? Yes, we did. Yeah. Uh, is there any not answered here? No, I think you got it, guy. You did a great job. David, thank you, and thank uh, Cable Kerr Group and Instrumentarium for you know all the help and support you give us. and. Uh, what we're doing and getting the word out out there. Very good. Well, I hope everyone tunes in uh, next time uh, when we um, will be talking about dental devices, and we're looking forward to uh, um, 
doing that. If there's questions that pop up and we didn't get to someone, uh, contact us here and we will get the question to you. And again, I think one of the questions that came up was your uh, Keller will be getting you your CE if you uh, 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 signed in and you need that. So um, look forward to seeing it at one of our courses again uh, or uh, the, the symposium. Um, or trying the free trial of Dental Sleep Solutions in DS3. So thanks, everyone, for spending your evening, and uh, we will talk to you in August, hopefully. Night. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Dave.